you have found an aerial terminology video from the ultralight airplane workshop. The aerodynamic term we're going to talk about is the longitudinal static stability. For those of you who might be new to the channel or have not seen one of these aerial terminology videos, I make these little videos to help support the design videos. Since we use a lot of terminology in the design videos and we don't really want to spend a lot of time going over and over in each video the definition or, or explanation of some of our aerodynamic terms, I make these videos and refer to them in the design videos so that if we run across a term that you're not familiar with, you can go watch one of these aerial terminology videos to see what we're talking about. Once we understand the longitudinal stability, you can actually go through and design the horizontal tail on our airplane. And having that designed correctly in both surface area and length behind the main wing, and by the way, we're in this case, we're just talking about a conventional configuration with a, a tail behind a wing. We're not doing a canard or any unusual configuration. Once we understand this, we can design a tail that will make our plane fairly safe to fly. It'll be stable in pitch. So let's get started. The reference that I've used in making these slides is an article that appeared in Kit Planes magazine quite a few years back, written by Donald Crawford. The article is part of a multi-part series called Airplane Design, and this particular one that we're talking about is part two, Introduction to the Static Stability and Control. So let's get a definition that Mr. Crawford used, and I'll just go ahead and read. I hate reading bullet points from slides. I generally just talk about them. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and read it out. The tendency for airplane to return to equilibrium condition, and that condition we're talking about is level flight where it's trimmed, basically hands off flying level. Static stability is the ability to return to that condition after you've had a small disturbance, like a little bit of turbulence or a passenger or a pilot moving around, something like that. Now, there's going to be quite a bit of math involved in this, unfortunately. There just has to be. There's no way around it. But before we get into that math, we need to talk about some of the terms we're going to be using. And I've drawn a diagram here to help talk about those terms. We've got a conventionally configured airplane with a main wing up front and a horizontal tail in back. So the main wing has lift, lifting the airplane. And in general, you have to have a tail pushing down for a stable airplane. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. But you could also have the arrow going up, but it would be a negative lift then. Now these lifts are generally considered to be in an aerodynamic center, which is what this little circle with the cross through it is indicating, aerodynamic center. We also have an aerodynamic center for the whole airplane. And that's here, and it's also called a neutral point. And the previous aero terminology video that we made talked about what that aircraft neutral point is. We also have a pitching moment around that neutral point, which is the pitching moment for the entire airplane. We also have a center of gravity for that airplane where you can consider all of the weight of the airplane to be concentrated just for calculation purposes. You can also have a moment around this center of gravity. And each of these things I've just talked about has a position on the airplane. And that's going to be a position from some reference point. And that's going to be an X position. For example, I got X sub CG. So that's the position of the center of gravity from ref some reference point. And in this particular case, I chose the reference point being the leading edge of the wing. Now, typically, that's not where you're going to have it. You're going to have it be something like the flange on the prop spinner or maybe the nose of the airplane. Something like that is generally where you're going to have it. So when we have a statically stable airplane in, in the longitudinal axis, there's a pitch correction mechanism. And let's talk a little bit about what that mechanism is. So let's say we have our airplane trimmed. What that means is we're flying with no pitching moment. In other words, the nose is not trying to continuously go down. The nose is not trying to continually move up. And that's what we're talking about in pitch. Pitch is an up or down movement of the nose of the airplane. Now, what happens if we have a disturbance and the nose pitches up? 
what we want to do is have a pitching moment that causes that nose to come back down to our trimmed condition. And doing that would be a negative pitching moment. Now the more that nose pitches up, the more pitching moment we want to have to correct that. So that nose pitches way up, we want lots of pitching moment to start pitching it down, and then as it gets closer and closer to our trimmed condition, that pitching moment gets reduced more and more, in other words, gets smaller and smaller until it reaches zero. And that should then put us back in our zero pitching moment condition, our trimmed condition. And of course, the opposite also happens. If the nose pitches down, we want a positive pitching moment. We want that pitching moment to point that nose back up. And of course, the greater it pitches down, the greater we want an upward pitching moment until we get back to a zero pitching moment where we're trimmed again. Well, mechanically or aerodynamically, how do we get that pitching moment? Well, let's go back to our previous slide. Now you'll notice we have the CG in front of the aircraft neutral point. That's one of the things that you need in order to have a statically stable airplane. Let's talk a little bit about this tail, this horizontal tail, and its negative angle of attack. Now we said that we have this neutral point, which is where all the aerodynamic forces on the airplane can be thought to act. So we then consider the total lift of the airplane to be acting through this point, and that's going to be pointing up. We have the center of gravity, the total weight of the airplane, in front of that, and it's pointing down. Well, that's going to want to rotate the airplane, point the nose down. So we have to counter that somehow, and that's what we do with this horizontal tail. This horizontal tail is going to be pushing down, since we have a negative angle of attack, and we design it so that it has enough surface area and a far enough length back so that downward force will match opposite direction this tendency for the center of gravity to bring the nose down. So our static stability is dependent on having that center of gravity in front of the neutral point and the tail pushing down to counter it. And now we're going to get into a little more detail about how this works when we have changing conditions. Let's talk about two of the mechanisms that are used to give us our static stability. One of those is going to be how the airplane reacts when the angle of attack is changed. And the other one is going to be how the plane reacts when speed is changed. So first let's talk about the angle of attack mechanism. Let's assume that we are in our trimmed condition. We're flying straight and level, at least for this example. And then we hit some air turbulence and that air turbulence causes our nose to pitch up. So we're going to assume that our speed stays the same, it's just that our tail has come down, our nose has gone up, so now we have a greater angle of attack on that free air stream. And for the moment, I'm going to ignore the fact that we really have more left on the main wing. And we're going to assume that because of that angle of attack, we really don't have a change in the pitching moment of the main wing. But, we do have a change in the pitching moment due to our tail. Now in this case, our tail is pretty darn close to a zero angle of attack. It's almost straight even with our free air stream. And that's because, like I mentioned before, when we were flying in our trimmed condition, we had a slight nose down on that tail. But here, after we've pitched up, that tail is down close to zero. And it's, I'm just using that for an example. It could actually be a little more, a little less, depending on your angle of attack. But here, I'm just to make it a little easier, it's nearly equal with the free air stream. And because of that, I have removed the lift from the tail. It no longer has any lift at this angle of attack. Well, since we don't have any lift, nothing pulling down on it, and of course, nothing pushing up, that means that our moment due to our CG being in front of our neutral point is going to cause our nose to come down. It's going to be a down pitching moment. So as that nose comes down, our tail starts going up, and we get back to our trimmed condition. And by the way, I'm also going to 
ignore dynamic effects uh, just to make it this description a little bit easier. Well, let's talk about the opposite action then. We have some turbulence that causes our nose to pitch down. Our tail pitches up. Well, now the angle of attack of our tail is significantly more than it was in our trim condition. That means that the downforce exerted by our tail is a lot more than it had been. Now, the moment due to our CG is constant. Since we're now increased this downforce, it's going to cause our nose to pitch up, tail to come down, and then as we get closer and closer to our trimmed condition, this downforce will decrease until it equals what we had in our trimmed condition. And so that's how our stability mechanism works when angle of attack changes. And just talk about the dynamic part of it a little bit. Most airplanes won't just come straight back to the trim condition and stop. Most airplanes will actually have a little bit of an oscillation. So you'll actually overshoot your trim condition a little bit, then come back, overshoot it back a little bit, but not as far as initially was, and you'll overshoot, and there'll be a little bit of an oscillation that slowly dies off. And that's what most planes will have. Well, now let's talk about our other mechanism. In this case, speed change. So a different upset mechanism in this case is instead of a gust, let's say you're flying along in the trimmed condition, and then you push down on the stick and hold it there until your airspeed stabilizes. And that would be this orange condition here. So you have about the same angle of attack in the shallow dive as we did in our flat cruise condition. But we are now in a dive, which means we're going faster than we had been. Now we release that forward pressure on the stick so that the elevator is back in line with the horizontal stabilizer. And remember, lift on a flying surface is proportional to the velocity squared. That means that even though the angle of attack was the same, now that we're going faster, we have more downforce on this tail. And since we have more downforce, tail goes down, nose comes up, the, the airplane will start slowing down as we come up to our flat trimmed condition. And the opposite will be basically true. Let's say you pull up on your stick a little bit, hold it there until you've got a stabilized airspeed, and that airspeed is going to be lower. And since that airspeed is lower, but angle of attack is still the same, airspeed is lower, so you're going to have less downforce on the tail. Since you have less downforce on the tail, nose goes down, tail comes up. And as that's happening, our airplane starts speeding up to our cruise condition. Now, again, as I mentioned before, we're probably going to oscillate and go back and forth through our cruise trimmed condition, but that oscillation will die out and we'll be back to our steady state cruise condition. So that is the second mechanism that we get our static stability in this conventional configuration with the tail behind the main wing. Now we can talk about a graphical form of explaining what we just talked about. In this case, we're talking about how the coefficient of moment about that center of gravity changes with angle of attack. Let's say we have an airplane that's cruising along and it is in a trimmed condition. That would put us at this point here. So we've got a slight positive angle of attack and our coefficient of moment, our moment about the CG, is zero. Now if we get disturbed, there's some turbulence and let's say it pitches us up. So that increases our angle of attack. Well that means that our coefficient of moment is now negative. It's going to push the nose down. That will move us back to our trim condition. If we have some turbulence or something causes our nose to pitch down, then we decrease our angle of attack. We, heck, we may even go negative, And that will increase our coefficient of moment, making it positive and pitching our nose back up. That will move us back down to our trimmed condition eventually. But let's say we pull back on the stick get trimmed out to a new condition where our angle of attack is much higher. 
An example of that would be setting up a climb. Let's say you want to climb several thousand feet and you don't want to have to be pulling back on the stick that whole time. You would pull back, establish your climb, and then trim the airplane so that you no longer have to have that constant back pressure. So that would be a trimmed, higher angle of attack condition. If you do that, you actually move this line over this direction. You've got a greater angle of attack, but you're trimmed out, so that would put you here. And again, if you pitch up due to some disturbance, you move down this line, you have the increase your angle of attack, you have a negative coefficient of moment, it moves you back up this way. Now we've talked about in the neutral point for the airplane aero terminology video about neutral stability. That would occur with a flat line. So no matter what your angle of attack was, your coefficient of moment is constant. So that's just kind of a graphical way of, of describing what we just described earlier. And uh, something that's on here I guess I should mention, this little thing here. For a stable airplane, the slope of this line has to be negative. And that's what we have here. A positive slope would be this direction. This is a zero slope. So this basically says the differential of the coefficient of moment at the CG with respect to angle of attack. That's what this little bit here means. That which basically means the slope of line. When you got a, a straight line, that's all it means is the slope. So like I said, this has to be less than zero just to have a statically stable airplane. So it could be a steeper, it could be shallower, but it has to be a negative slope. And that's critical to having a stable airplane. So remember that when we get into the map. And that's what we're about to do. Well, we know that we want that slope of the differential of coefficient of moment at CG with respect to the angle of attack to be less than zero, which is this down here. How are we going to determine that? Well, how do we get the coefficient of moment at the CG? Well, I'm just going to throw this out here instead of deriving it. And you can go and look at Crawford's article to get a little more detail. But it is essentially the moment at the CG divided by Q, surface area, and the mean aerodynamic chord where Q is one half of the air pressure times the velocity squared. Now, this should look fairly familiar to you from our coefficient of lift aero terminology video. Well, how do we get the moment about the CG? Well, that's pretty easy. We just do a little summing up. We want the moment about the neutral point minus the lift times the distance between the neutral point position and the position of the CG. Now if we substitute this up into this equation, we come up with this down here. Now if you remember, Q times surface area times the chord underneath lift gives us coefficient of lift. So that's where this came from. Well, in order to get this, we have to take the differential of this with respect to the angle of attack. If you remember in our aero terminology video on the neutral point, the moment about the neutral point with respect to angle of attack is constant. As you change the angle of attack, this moment doesn't change. The differential of a constant is zero. So that becomes zero. So we are left with this here, which is represented once you do the differential by this here. So the differential of the coefficient of lift with respect to angle of attack multiplied by the position of the neutral point minus position of the center of gravity over the mean aerodynamic chord. So this total value has to be less than zero. Like I said before in that previous slide, this slope, the differential of the coefficient of moment with respect to angle of attack has to be negative. That's this, and it has to be negative. Now, this little part here is called the static margin, and I've pulled that out separately over here. So static margin has to be greater than zero, or equal to zero if you just want to have neutral stability. What this really is is the distance from the neutral point to the CG divided by your mean aerodynamic chord. That gives you 
the percent that the CG is in front of the neutral point of the aerodynamic cord. The greater that distance is, that percentage is, the greater your static margin is. So if this is positive, this minus sign mean, makes this whole thing negative. Okay, we're a little bit closer. But now we've got to figure out how do we calculate the differential of the coefficient lift with respect to angle of attack. We've referred to this a little bit before, especially in the design videos talking about how we were selecting our airfoil. We have that coefficient of lift versus angle of attack diagrams that we've looked at. An example here is one of those. So you'll typically see a slope that's fairly straight until you start getting up to the higher angles of attack, and then you have a stall, which means you've reached the maximum coefficient of lift of your airfoil. Those diagrams were for section coefficient of lift. It's basically two-dimensional. It really doesn't take into account the shape of the wing at all, but we need to do that. So we need to take into account the aspect ratio, the sweep, the Mach number, the fuselage is gonna interfere. So we need to take into account all that in order to get this for each flying surface. Now Crawford, in his articles, comes up with this. Now he got it for some other references, so it's not really worth going into the derivation of this. It's a fairly complicated formula, but not too bad. So AR is the aspect ratio, and this A here is a differential of coefficient lift respect to angle of attack, but taking into account the mock and the sweep. And that's this over here. Now this A sub zero is the section coefficient lift, which you would get from your airfoil analysis programs. And you're going to take the sweep, which is this angle over here, and that's at the mid chord of the wing. M is the Mach number. So you run through that calculation and you're going to get this A to substitute into here. But for our airplane, we're going to assume no sweep, even though there's a very tiny amount, and we're going to assume our Mach number is pretty much zero. If we do that, then basically this A is our section coefficient left, so we could ignore all that. Now, if we had some sweep, and if or and or we were going really fast, had a Mach number, let's say 0.1 or more, then it becomes a little more significant. We're going to ignore all this and just say that A is our section coefficient left. Now we need to correct for the fuselage because the fuselage is going to interfere with the wing. So this value here sub E is this value up here. So you take whatever you calculated from here, substitute down in here, and now we have to take into account the fuselage. Now this is the effective surface area of the wing. So basically the total surface area minus the surface area that's taken up by nacelles, fuselage, things like that. So you subtract out that for surface area to get the effect of surface area. This is the entire surface area, including fuselage and nacelles, etc. This is the width of the fuselage. This is the total tip to tip span of the wing. And you plug all that wonderful stuff in there. And now we finally get our differential of coefficient lift with respect to alpha. And we can plug it into here to get our differential coefficient of moment at the CG. Oh, I just noticed that's backwards uh, with respect to angle of attack. Now, this value here is called the fuselage correction factor. So if you see a K sub B, that's this value here. That's just to let you know in case you see something called the fuselage correction factor. So, since we're ignoring sweep and ignoring Mach number, just what does changing aspect ratio do to our slope of the coefficient lift respect to angle of attack? Well, that's what, let's go back down here. Now, I got this out of Evans Light Plane Designer's Handbook on page 37. And it kind of gives you an idea. Here's an aspect ratio of infinity. Of course, you can't build a wing like that. So this is essentially what a two-dimensional wing would be. Now on all of these, just consider that the chord is constant across aspect ratios, which means of course the surface area isn't constant, but only way to 
to uh, think about this particular diagram is the chord is constant. Now this one shows an aspect ratio of 8. So it has decreased the slope. The next one is a 6 aspect ratio and here's a 4 aspect ratio. So as your wing gets stubbier and stubbier, shorter and shorter as far as span goes, your wing is going to stall at a higher angle of attack and the slope gets smaller and smaller. So that's basically how changing the aspect ratio is going to change this slope. Well now we get to the nitty-gritty. We're going to use the position and size of our horizontal tail to position our neutral point. And as we said before, that neutral point has to be behind the position of the center of gravity in order to have that negative slope on our differential of the coefficient of moment at center of gravity with respect to the angle of attack. And the farther back it is behind that center of gravity, the greater our static margin is and the more stable our airplane will be. Well, how are we going to calculate that position? We need to calculate a change in the pitching moment with respect to angle of attack. That's this XM. We need to divide that by the change in lift with respect to angle of attack. And that's going to be this bottom one. And you'll again, I would recommend going to look at Crawford's article in order to get the derivation of where this comes from. At this point, let's just get down nitty gritty to figure out how to calculate this. So how do we calculate that pitching moment as the angle of attack changes? What we need to do is do a calculation of the pitching moment for each flying surface of our airplane. So this little equation here, we're going to do for each flying surface and then we're going to add them up. This Q is going to be the same for all these flying surfaces. And guess what? Q is used down here also and will be the same for all these flying surfaces. It's going to be in the numerator and in the denominator, which means Q cancels out, so we can actually ignore that. So we need to know where the aerodynamic center is for each flying surface, and that's with respect to our reference point. And then our differential of the coefficient lift respect to angle attack, we just talked about that before in the previous slide. The effective surface area. This mu, just assume that it's one, we'll ignore that for now. You can, again, go look at Crawford's article to figure out what this mu is, but for us, it's close enough to one that we can just ignore it. And the fuselage correction factor, and we just talked about that also. So for each flying surface, you're going to add that up. Now, let's calculate the change in lift with respect to angle of attack. It is essentially the same calculation, except you leave out this position value. So for each flying surface, do this calculation again, sum all those up. Put that up here in the denominator, do your little calculation, and then by the way, we've only got two surfaces, so this is really easy to do. We got the main wing and the horizontal tail. That will then give you the position of the neutral point with respect to your reference. And by golly, we now know, now that we know the position of our neutral point, what our static margin is. Voila! So that's it for this video talking about the longitudinal pitch stability. And with this information, we can now design our horizontal tail.